Well, brothers and sisters, once again, God has blessed us with this moment once again to be able to come and share with you through the Word of God, through the teaching of the Sunday School lesson. And as always, we have a great and wonderful lesson. We'll be coming out of the book of Isaiah for this week. Bow with me now as we go into a word of prayer. <clears throat> Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity again. And we thank you, O oh Lord, that you have kept us safe through the many dangers seen and unseen in this life that we have faced since the last time we were able to do this. But we pray, O oh Lord, that each and every day that you give us strength and life, that you will continue to hold us and increase our knowledge, our wisdom, and our understanding of your word in every way. And help us to continue to grow and to conform more as Christ, as Christ's life was in every way. We need you. Open us up as we go into this lesson and pour into us all those things that you have for us at this time and help us in every way in our understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our lesson today comes from Isaiah, the sixth chapter, the first through the eighth verse, uh, with the title of our lesson, Holy, Holy, Holy. The theme as we move, it, move into the month of June, uh, since this is starting a new quarter, is still God's people. Uh, God's people worship with a subtitle for the month of, of June, uh, the prophet and the praise. So we're going back into the Old Testament and uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the prophets. I started off with Isaiah and what God had for them to do. And as we look into our lesson today, we'll be looking at the call of Isaiah. Uh, when God called him into ministry to go out there and preach the word of God to those who were in need of it as we must continue to do this day. Before we get into our lesson, though, I want to read a little bit of background to kind of help us to kind of understand what was going on at this particular time when uh, Isaiah was called into ministry. Uh, follow along with me as I read. It says, Isaiah, he was the son of Ammon and a prophet of the southern kingdom of Judah who lived in the 8th century B.C. Isaiah lived and ministered in Jerusalem for 58 years. He prophesied during the reigns of kings Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Although the Bible does not record the tribe from which Isaiah is descended, Jewish tradition suggests that Isaiah may have been related to Judah's royal family. This would explain why Isaiah enjoyed relatively easy access uh, to the king of Judah. Isaiah is believed to have been the author of the biographies of King Uzziah, which is 2 Chronicles 26 and 22, you see reference, and King Hezekiah, uh, 2 Chronicles 32 and 32, which we see reference to both of those uh, situations. At God's direction, Isaiah humbled himself and went about for three years naked and barefoot. We see that in Isaiah 20. No other prophet predicted the birth of the Messiah, Christ Jesus, to the extent that Isaiah did. He also prophesied extensively about the ministry and the suffering of the Messiah uh, for the sins of humanity. While it is not certain exactly how Isaiah died, a pseudo-epigraphical work meaning a piece falsely attributed uh, to biblical character called the Ascension of Isaiah states that he was sawed in two uh, with a wooden saw during the range of Manasseh. So we can see that uh, being a prophet was not very popular and it also was very costly uh, as well, which most time they cost a lot of their lives. Background. 8th century BC was a tumultuous time for the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah. This period saw the rise of four major prophets, Amos, and Hosea uh, in, in Israel, and Isaiah and Micah in Judah. <clears throat> According to Isaiah 6 and 1, Isaiah received his call in about 742 BC, the year King Uzziah died. King Uzziah, also known as Azariah, began his long range in 783 BC. In about 750 BC, Jotham and his son was made co-regent. After the death of his father, Jotham reigned seven more years. When Isaiah began his ministry, Menahem, king of Israel, uh, was king of Israel. 
Menahem was the fourth king in less than one year. Jeroboam's death, Jeroboam's second to death, in 746, after 40 years on the throne, was followed by six kings leading to the fall of Samaria in 721 BC to the Assyrians. In the southern kingdom, Jotham succeeded Ahaz and then came Hezekiah. This age was marked by a rise of Assyria to become the dominant power in the Near East. Tiglath Pilsa III ascended to the throne in 745 BC and ruled until 727 BC. In the second year in power, shortly before Isaiah began his ministry, he marched his army westward and occupied Israel. <clears throat> As a vassal state, Israel was expected to be to make regular payments to the king of Assyria. After a range of 10 years, King Menahem's son, Pekahiah, succeeded him. The next year, the Assyrian king, Tiglath Pilsen, sent his army to Palestine, Syria, and Israel, and invaded Judah in 733 BC. This was called the Syro Ephraimite War. Although many were killed, including the the son of the king, these armies were unable to invade the capital city of Jerusalem. Rather than rely on God, King Ahaz foolishly sent a tribute of gold and silver to Tiglath Pilsa III and asked for his assistance. The Assyrians defeated the Syrians and northern kingdom armies, but were very quickly, but very quickly Judah became a vassal state of Assyria. The combination of exile, resettlement of foreign people in Israel, and Judah led to the creation of the people known as the Samaritans uh, of the New Testament. So that gives us a little background about the turmoil and the different things that were going on uh, during the period of time when Isaiah was called into ministry. Like say, King uh, Uzziah had died at this particular time. Uh, the people were without a king, without leadership. They was in turmoil. And a lot of things would happen. So we can see God really needed a voice for him and for the people to stand up and to go out and proclaim his word and to get them to turn around and come back because Israel and Judah had fallen away and had gone away from those things which God had commanded for them to do. So instead of just totally coming in and doing what God could do if he wanted to, which is to pass judgment, he always gives us the opportunity to come back. And that's the great thing about God is that he will give us a chance and the opportunity to come back and redeem ourselves uh, before him. So let's get into our lesson because we have a little bit of my background now, what was going on, what was happening, and, uh, and the things that Isaiah was facing as he was called into ministry. So let's get into our lesson, um, chapter 6, verse 1, and let's see what it says. Verse 1 says this, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train um, and his train filled the temple. Listen to this. It is significant that Isaiah's call to the prophetic ministry is dated in the year that King Uzziah died. Uzziah had ruled Judah for approximately 40 years. Isaiah was born and grew into manhood during the range of during his range. He had, in fact, never known another king. The splendor of Uzziah's range is described in detail in 1 Kings 15, 1 through 7, and 2 Chronicles 27. These accounts tell how he modernized the armies, conquered the territory of the Philistines, extended his commercial activities into Arabia, reconstructed the copper and iron works at Etham, and took an enlightening interest in agriculture. His reign brought peace and prosperity, such as the nation had not known since the days of Solomon. As a people, Israel turned uh, their backs on God and his requirement for his chosen people. The king, having finally been struck by God with leprosy, was now dead after living in a continuous state of alienation from the people and God. We see that in 2 Corinthians 26, 18 through 21. The people so enjoyed their sin that even the
the nation's prophets had been unsuccessful in gathering them away from their departure from God's light. Isaiah must have felt like a failure, fearfully standing alone in heaven, awaiting the punishment from his holy father that he was sure would come. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw another king, though, seated upon the throne. Judah's throne was empty, but heaven's throne was occupied by the king of Judah. That kept by, the, by the king of glory, Judah's king might come and go into an endless procession, but this king would reign forever and ever. He was uh, the king and his throne was exalted above all earth's thrones. We must not minimize the significance of what Isaiah saw. While the vision may have come to him in Jerusalem temple, he saw far more than one could see uh, in the Jerusalem temple. For a brief moment, the veil was drawn back and he was permitted to look into the heavenly temple, the spiritual reality of which the earthly temple was a symbol. So we see that in his call, God sent and gave Isaiah a vision, and he was able to, to not only understand that the king also had died, had seen him, but now God has taken him into heaven, and now he sees God Almighty sitting on his throne, and now he's going to see what's going to happen as as we go forth in this lesson. Because God is about God is about to pronounce judgment on Israel. And we're going to see the reaction of Isaiah, how he feels, and what happens when he sees all this, and what goes through his mind. But the interesting part about all this is, is that no matter how good God was to Israel and how good God took care of Israel, Israel still fell back and fell away from what God had for them to do as his chosen people. And the sad part about that is, even as the church today, we're still doing a lot of those same things. Those things that God has called us out to do, to be set aside and be separated from, uh, from this world and do his work and carry a gospel message, we still find ourselves tied up and twisted up and, 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 and woven into this world to where sometimes we, it's hard to identify us uh, from that of those of the world. So we just have to learn to understand from examples and we have to learn to understand from reading God's word that we have to learn to stay in God's will and his way because it's not the same thing that happened to Israel, judgment and, and punishment, those same things come into our lives as well too. So as a people and as a nation, we have to learn to follow those things. So in the year that King Ozai died, God gave Isaiah a vision as to what he wanted for him to do. And then in the latter part of verse one, he says, and his train filled the temple. And the train means uh, a hem, an edge, or his robe, or his, his gown. Uh, it, it filled the whole temp heavenly temple uh, as Isaiah saw this vision. And then verse 2, it says this, and it says, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face. And with twain, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. So what are seraphims? Seraphim, the Hebrew word used here for God's messengers, place an emphasis on the fact that God is ultimately holy. The seraphim, described as the burning ones, must appear to Isaiah like fire, standing above the throne, waiting to serve God. So they were the, the, the angels that related to fire. Isaiah saw that the Lord seated was seated, Isaiah saw the Lord seated upon his throne, attended by the host of heaven. This was no ordinary occasion in heaven, uh, in the heavenly court, for the case of Judah was to be tried. God had summoned the heavenly council to sit in judgment upon the sin of the nation. When Isaiah was presented, permitted to look in upon the proceedings, a verdict had already been handed down and the nation had been pronounced guilty. However, God had not yet appointed a messenger to report the verdict to the nation and to pronounce sentence upon it. The most surprising development was the choice of Isaiah to be uh, the messenger. 
So we see right now that Isaiah is now in a court proceeding. God has called the heavenly host together. He has allowed Isaiah to come and be a part of this. So Isaiah can, can see and witness what's going on, but also understand what God is about to do. And, and, and again, this is the interesting thing. Even though God will punish and God will do some things to us, God is still loving enough to give us an opportunity to come back and change our ways and repent and move away from the judgment that could be ours if we continue on in the path that we continue on. So he gives us an opportunity. So, so, so now we see that the heavenly court is in session. God has allowed Isaiah to come and be a part of this and see that and understand that the judgment that his fiction be passed down on, on Judah is about to come down. And uh, But the, the thing he does not know at this particular time is that he is going to be the one that God is going to use to carry his message to the people in order to help them to turn around. And like I said, Isaiah ministered some 40 years in, 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 uh, in Judah. And we can still see the results of it that, that even though all that ministry, people's hearts still stayed hard and they still fell into captivity and into sin. So it, it takes a lot. It takes a lot to be a man or a woman of God and stand and preach and do the things that God would have you to do in truth and in righteousness in every way. So we see the seraphims uh, as they stood above uh, the altar. And then it said they had six wings. Uh, six wings with one pair of wings or twain. Um, the seraphims covered their eyes lest they peer into the divine and with another pair they cover their feet in humble acknowledgement that they stand upon holy ground. Isaiah now sees himself more clearly as an unclean creature dwelling in the midst of rebellious creatures, also two with them which wish to fly a symbol of their readiness to serve. So this is the interesting thing that we'll see as we get into to, to, to this uh, passage of scripture. Even though he sees a heavenly scene and he sees a, 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 a court proceeding in process, but the other great thing about all of this is that Isaiah also sees himself for how sinful that he is. See, when you come in, when we come into the presence of God and God in all his holiness and all his righteousness, we cannot help but see our own sinfulness and our own filthiness and our own, own unrighteousness and we have to understand just like Isaiah it, it, that sin cannot stand in the presence of God so we have to understand that we are in a situation that is very very critical at that particular time but we're going to see what God did for Isaiah in order to clean him up and prepare him and fix him but th this is what this relationship with, with Jesus Christ is all about the more we grow into Christ the more we're going to see how uh, 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 short that we are of God's glory. And this is what Isaiah is going to see in this lesson today, how short he was and you know, I, however he lived prior to this time or whatever he was doing, because we're going to see how he had to be cleansed and washed. And this is what all of us have to do once we get into this relationship with Jesus Christ, that we have to be changed, we have to be cleansed, we have to be washed, and we have to be set anew. And, uh, and in that way, we can be ready to prepare to serve God as we should. We become a new creation in Christ. And this is what basically what God did for Isaiah. He made him a new person through by his cleansing and his ability to be put in a position to serve and to do those things that God would have for him to do. But let's look at verse 3. Let's pick this up. We should be able to see this in our lesson. And verse 3 and 4. And it says, one cried unto another and said, holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled uh, with smoke. As the seraphims uh, about the heavenly throne, they sang uh, to the praise of God, glory. Their threefold repetition of holy uh, served to em emphasize the uniqueness of Israel's God. <clears throat> The latter part of this song translated literally means the fullness of all the earth is his glory. In other words, the prophet was experiencing a total awareness of God's of God 
everything in the creative order spoke of him, of, of God's glory. He was so completely surrounded by the divine presence so that he could not escape it no matter where he turned. Holy is derived from a root word which, which is separate, which means to which means to separate, to cut off. To say that God is holy means first, first of all, that he is God and not man. He is ultimately separated from all that is creaturely or sinfully, creatively or sinfully. This does not mean, of course, that he is remote from his creation. He is, he is from man, uh, from his creation. He is from man, but not distant from him. Hosea has expressed this, this better than any other. For he says, I am God and not man, the holy one uh, in your midst. And we see that in Hosea 11 and 19. As a result of this experience, the holiness of God became one of the dominant themes in Isaiah's preaching. His favorite term for God was the holy one of Israel, a term which appears about 30 times in his book. He knew that Judah's very existence depended upon her attitude toward the holiness of God. So we see this scene again where the, where the angels, the seraphim, are crying, holy, holy, holy. And the whole earth is full of God's glory. And all of it, is, it, 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 it gives, it, it shows the glory of God and uh, the, uh, uh, all the good things that, that God represents and, 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 and gives to him uh, as being who he is. So, so the, 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 the seraphims are doing their job. They're, 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 uh, they're expressing who God is. And Isaiah is taking all this in, and he's going to begin to see and feel and understand how great God is in his awesome position as he looks and as he understands what the serial films are saying. And again, when you come into the presence of God, you just can't stay the same. It, it's just no way. And we're going to see that in Isaiah's life, is that by coming in the presence of God, he understands that he really sees himself for who he is. You know, sometimes if you if you get an opportunity, and especially if you come from the world into Christ, and you go back and uh, you start looking at things like pictures or start telling stories or families get together and, and, and they bring up things, and sometimes you have to go back and think, was, was I really that person? Because you begin to see yourself then as you are now in Christ and understand what the difference is and how far you have come and what God has done for you in life. So we, we actually see how, how, how far off from God that we were, but we have to thank God that we are now in where we are with him now simply because of the fact that God has changed our lives. So we're going to see from the angel's presentation, the seraphim's presentation of showing how holy God is, and now as we go into our uh, verses below, we're going to see how Isaiah sees himself as well, too, uh, as part of this setting and, 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 and how his, his, his relationship and how things are going to change because of what, what he sees and what God is going to do for him. Let's get into the verse, the verse 4. And it says, verse 4 says, And the post of the door moved at his voice on him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Uh, the scene is one that must have been overwhelming and frightening, uh, as not only were there seraphim proclaiming God's holiness and glory, but also the temple itself shook because of the power and the voice that, that, that God had. Then there was smoke, which may be similar to the Shinnaka cloud that represented God's presence with the Israelites in the desert. What a predicament for Isaiah, who by this time must have felt that his death was imminent. And that was, that's, that's something that has to go through his mind because he's seeing all these things happening. Smoke, doorposts shaking, the, the seraphim hollering, holy, holy, holy. So Isaiah probably has to conceive in his mind that something to him, especially if nothing else, is fixing to happen. And, it, and it's not going to be good because of all that's happening uh, in this vision. Let's look at verse 5 and let's see what he says about all this. So now once he sees all this happening, smoke, uh, the doorpost shaking, the smoke filling the temples, the, the seraphim hollering, 
saying, holy, holy, holy. This is what he says in verse five. He says this. He says, then said I, woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen what the king, the Lord of hosts. So now what was his first action after all sin and all that? He said, woe. In Hebrew, it stands for a passionate cry of grief or despair because he knew that he felt or he felt like he was in trouble because of, of his position outside of God, but his position in the vision and seeing what was about to happen and what was going on. So what did he say in verse five? He says what? He said, woe who he said what? For I am undone. And what does undone mean? Uh, it means on the verge of perishing uh, in the face of this revelation of God. So he thought surely that things are old for him and that his end was come based upon the things he had seen and the place where he was at in life. Listen to this. Having met God as the Holy One, Isaiah was at once smitten with the consciousness of his own sin and defilement. His experience represented a new dimension in man's understanding of the concept of holiness. Here too before, someone brought into an awareness of the holiness of God had been smitten with a sense of his own creatureness. Isaiah was aware only of his sinfulness. He feared God not because he was a man, but because he was a sinful man. Holiness, therefore, had taken a more had taken on a moral quality that he did not possess prior to this. Isaiah's response to the vision of God was that of a man brought face to face with death. From his lips burst forth an agonizing cry of despair. Woe is me, for I am lost or undone. The word translated lost means to be cut off, cut down, or destroyed. Isaiah thought that for one such as he to look into the face of God meant certain death. However, he had failed to make allowances for the mercies of God. Isaiah had never realized the depth of his sin and depravity until he stood in the revealing light of God's holiness. He was at once aware of the defilement of his lips and of the lips of the people. His lips were unclean like the flesh of a leper, while his consciousness of defilement was focused here rather than elsewhere is not clear. Why is it focused on the lips rather than anything else is not clear? So maybe Isaiah, just like many of us, had problems with the things we say and we did. Perhaps the best explanation is that he may already have sensed that God wanted him to become a prophet, a messenger of heavenly court. Someone like Moses, though for a different reason, he felt himself unworthy to undertake such a task. It has been noted that an Akkadian and Egyptian prophet had to submit to certain mouth purification rites before they were permitted to speak the oracles of the gods. In like manner, Isaiah's commission was delayed until his lips had been cleansed. So we can see that in this process of, of, of coming to God and being changed, all of us have to be cleansed. All of us have to be clean. All of us have to be redone over because we cannot come into God's work or God's presence with the sinful nature that we have. So I said at this particular time thought it was it was over for him that it was it was fixing to be uh he was fixing to be cut off because he was in the presence of God, he saw the holiness of God, and he understand, he understood, I should say, at that particular time that he was so dirty, he was so unclean, and he was not to be fit to be in the presence of God. So therefore he thought his end was at hand. But God had something else for him to do. And he's going to find out what that's something else to do. But so, but we have to understand, we have to be cleaned up as we come into this relationship with God. We just can't come to God any and every kind of way and expect for God to work in, the, in our lives. So just like Isaiah, we all have to be transformed into a new creature. That's what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 and, 2, uh, 5 and 17, that once coming into Christ, you know, old things pass away. We become a new creature. Old things pass away, and uh, and we become new in Christ.
And that's what we got to understand. We cannot stay the same uh, and come into this relationship with Jesus Christ because of sinful nature and God's holy nature just does not mix. So we see that Isaiah realized how unclean he was, how fit he was. And like I say, one of the first things he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. Again, we have to clean ourselves up from our speech to our habits to everything that we do once coming into Christ and understand that God has a greater work for us to do. We can't stay the chance saying, if we the same way we are 20 years down the road from when we got converted, there's not much growth that has taken place in our life. We have to walk a different walk. We have to talk a different talk. And we have to do those things that would be conformed to what God has for us to do. Verse 6 and 7. It says, And then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had uh, taken with the tongs from off the altar, and laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched thy lip, and that iniquity is taken away, thy sins are purged. Thy sins purged, and thy sins purged. So this is how God has to clean us up. He did it this way for Isaiah. We do it our way. We come in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. Note, the manner in which the prophet's lips were cleansed is highly significant. Um, one of the seraphims flew uh, with a burning coal, which he had taken from the altar, uh, with a pair of tongs, in his, and pressed this to Isaiah's lips, thus symbolizing the removal of his guilt. This part of the vision suggests that there is there is no painless cure for sin. Forgiveness has always been secured at the price of suffering and death. When the seraphim had touched up Isaiah's lip, he pronounced his guilt, removed and removed his sins uh, and his sins were forgiven. Isaiah is given life and begins to experience God's love in a way he has never understood before. He is truly and completely love. And this is what Isaiah uh, had to understand. This is what we have to understand. God cleanses us and washes us and puts us back right because he loves us and he wants us to do well in life. And verse 7 says, and thy iniquity is taken away. And iniquity, the Hebrew word for iniquity means guilt or punishment. And it comes from a root word that means to be bent, bowed down, twisted, or perverted. It is portrayed as sin, a perver perversion of life, a twisting of the right way, a perversion of truth. So all the things that was done wrong or not done right or, 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 or that was wrong in Isaiah's life, now all of that has been cleansed and turned around. And that's what happens to us when we come into this life of Christ, is that God cleanses us from all of our sins, all those past things that we have done. God has washed us and fixed us and cleansed us. But the great thing about it is we're going to sin even as coming into Christ. So he has that fixed too. All we have to do is come back and repent. And God will again forgive us and cleanse us of our, all of our sins and unrighteousness. That's what he does for us. And that's how good he is for us. Let's close this out in verse 8. And it said, <clears throat> And I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. So now Isaiah does what we all should do, accept the call of God as he has cleansed us and fixed us and prepared us for, uh, for mission work. With the sin and the shame now removed, Isaiah is not able for the first time to hear God speak. Isaiah hear God and cry who would be God's servant to go and carry the mission and the message he had for his covenant people. Isaiah answered the call in accepting God's call to be a prophet uh, to the people. Isaiah understood he was committing to represent God on earth. His task would be to guide the people and their leaders into a right relationship with God. Isaiah's experience with God and the burning coal from the altar helps the prophet recognize that God was not interested in the exact punishment on his rebellious people. Rather, God wanted to purge the people of the sin that separates God from his people. Isaiah commits himself to the proclamation of the message and will spend the rest of his life 
in this missionary enterprise. In embracing this call from God, Isaiah would live the rest of the life set apart for the people he was to serve. The price for accepting God's assignment was loneliness and isolation. From this point on, everything in the prophet's life was secondary to God's mission. Because of the vision of God's glory, Isaiah willingly would pay this price. And, and like I said, there are only those select few that God really calls up and really stands out and really be that, that leader that leads the people or uh, uh, is that voice to the nation. Now, all of us have our responsibility in Christ to do the things that we need to do. But certainly, every now and then, God has to raise that particular person up who is special and who stands out. And, and, and like I say, we never probably ever look at what they go through as a person and the sacrifice they make to try to come and help us to live in a better way and understand God's word. So even though it's a powerful life as a prophet, as a man or a woman of God, it can sometimes be a lonely and even a dangerous life. But it is a call that must be uh, answered. And we thank God that there were men like Isaiah who stood up and accepted the call and willing to do those things that, that God had for him to do. And that's what we should do. Be ready for the call that God has for us in our lives. Now, takeaway today is that, as I look at this lesson, is that we see, uh, we will see ourselves for what we are when we come into this relationship with Christ, as I, Isaiah did before God. And we will know also how far we have come, come short of God's glory. We too then can see the mercies and the goodness in our lives that God bestows upon us and then be ready to serve as Isaiah was. So once we come into this relationship as Isaiah did with God and our relationship with Christ, we're going to see how far we all are all from, uh, from God and what God has really done for us in our lives if we just sit down and look at it and really think about it. All the good things. God could have destroyed us. He could have taken us out here. But just like Israel, Judah, he wanted to give us that chance to come back before punishment came. We thank you. This is the end of our lesson. God bless you. Again, as I always say, hopefully something was said today that will give you the strength, the understanding, the wisdom, the knowledge that you need to continue on on this path for Christ. And that if God's will, we have this blessed opportunity to come back again. You take care and God bless you. Thank you. If you enjoy this program, call us right now, 404-688-6680, or send an email to info at mountpleasantatl.org. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church is a congregation full of life and love for everybody. Would you consider sowing an offering? Whatever God lays on your heart to give would be a blessing to the ministry. Thank you for your support. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia.